Lauren. I'm Leanne. And I'm Meteoric Mike. And this is Unschooled History. It's that time of year again in the U.S. when we celebrate our independence from England. And in that spirit, this week's episode is on fireworks and why we set them off every July 4th here in the U.S. We'll also explore the use of fireworks in other countries and at other times of year, such as New Year's Eve. Because, let's face it, fireworks are pretty darn awesome to a lot of people. I wonder, would this make this a flashpoint issue? Wow. Just as when I think your bad puns cannot get any worse. Oh, I'm always stretching for a new low. Or is it a new high? Well, I'm not sure. A new high in Lotus? I don't know, honey. I think that one was just a bomb. So it turns out that the earliest firecrackers were actually bamboo thrown into the fire. In the 2nd century BC, the Chinese discovered that if you toss the bamboo into a fire, the fire would cause the air pockets to overheat and explode. And they continued to do this to drive away evil spirits. Yeah, predominantly around their New Year festivals and other times. But it's really interesting. The bamboo, you know, the area between the knuckles is where it would boil what little liquid had accumulated there, produce steam, and boom. Which made for an excellent measurement, of course, for the size of the firecrackers that would be made later. Yes. By later, of course, we mean about 600 to 900 A.D. According to the American Pyrotechnics Association, it was around this time that a Chinese alchemist mixed up some potassium nitrate, sulfur, and charcoal to make the first black powder. They put it into hollow bamboo as well as into stiff paper tubes, and these were the first fireworks. We will not be covering how to make it on your own or giving exact proportions in this video. Sorry, but we really don't want anyone trying this at home unless they know that they're what they're doing and know which safety precautions to take and are taking them. We learned our lesson partially from watching people who go, went before, such as the Mythbusters and stuff. You can... You can get into big trouble by giving out lessons and having people hurt themselves. It's bad juju for us and bad juju for you if you follow this and you blow something up like a building, hand, finger, self. And while this information can be found fairly easily online, frighteningly easy as far as I'm concerned, we refuse to be responsible for someone doing something stupid. Stupid. So, as we always say with stuff that might be dangerous, don't try this at home. Please. There are enough fireworks, injuries, and deaths every year. And, of course, after the discovery of black powder, we didn't have to wait very long for explosives and weapons. By the 10th century, the Chinese and then the Japanese figured out how to make bombs like these to rain down terror on their enemies. They had quite a unique way of inventing bombs and things early on. The, if you've ever watched Mulan, the dragon missiles that they showed in there, those were based on actual weapons that existed. True, they are fancy and it is a cartoon, but they are based on weapons that existed back then. And one of those weapons is this one. About a hundred years later, during the 11th century, they had figured out how to fire explosives up into the air. And you get something like this. The Flying Cloud Thunderclap Eruptor. That's what the name translates to in English. And then people started becoming experts with these things, to the point that they would entertain the troops with it at night while still scaring the bejesus out of the enemy. That's one thing. If you know what's going on, it's entertaining. If you don't know what's going on, it'll make you brown trousers time. 
that's certainly what our dog thinks, isn't it? Yeah. Fortunately, he never takes that part literally. Not literally, but he's come close a couple of times. No, he just barks his little head off. <laughs> so it didn't take long after that for it to make its way to Europe. Europe got hold of gunpowder in the 13th century. The first European reference to it was by Roger Bacon in his work Opus Magus in 1267. The first visual depiction, this one, was created by Walter de Milemeet in 1326. And it shows a very, very early canon, possibly the first canon, though there is some debate based on your definition of what a canon is and who says what the Arabs have a much earlier date for using a cannon against the Mongols. But, yep. so, but there's a question, was it actually a cannon? Was this one actually a cannon? Scholars are not 100% certain which one is actually the first cannon. Also, there's a debate over whether or not where you draw the boundary over what's in Europe and what's still in Asia. Yeah, oh, yeah, that too. Because the Middle East, is that Europe or is that Asia? It's supposed to be, well, it depends on who you talk to. Most people say it's Eastern Europe, Far Eastern, but it's still, some people say Asia. Yeah, there's, it, it may be West Asia. Iran is definitely West Asia. Israel, uh, right on the border, I guess? I don't know. I'm not sure. I know that Rick Steves Europe goes to both Israel and Iran and skips everything in between. <laughs> so, we'll just say Middle East. Yeah. Obviously, this new discovery, gunpowder, became very popular for weapons, but fireworks also became popular very quickly for celebrating major military victories, as well as to enhance other public celebrations and religious festivities. The fire masters who were in charge had assistants called green men, so called because of their caps made of green leaves, which they wore to help protect them. I find that pretty interesting. Yeah, not really very protective though, are they? It would protect the head a little bit from sparks, but not much else. I wouldn't trust a cap made of leaves to protect me during fireworks. But then I don't wear any protective gear anyway when I'm setting them off. But then again, I've been raised around them my entire life. As we, these guys would have been. But we don't know what their fireworks were like. We know what ours are like. But we don't know how much, how much sparks and how much just boom those theirs were. Ours adhere to modern safety standards. <laughs> we don't know how big those booms were. The green men also doubled as jesters, getting the crowd riled up and entertained, and getting them ready for the big show. Okay, so then, of course, it made its way over to the U.S. Early American settlers brought their love of fireworks to the U.S. with them. Colonial Americans absolutely loved their fireworks. They really did. And they were involved in the very first Independence Day celebrations on July 4th, 1777. They were also used to draw crowds to political rallies after we formed our own government and had won our independence from the British. But they still didn't have any color. They were still just bright lights that didn't even really sparkle. They were just explosions. Kind well, of. if you listen to Francis Scott Key's um, song about the rocket's red glare, I think that was just the rocket's burning tail. I don't think that was the sparks given off by modern fireworks. I think that was just... Not to mention, if I remember correctly, Francis Scott Key's 
song, wasn't that actually written during the Civil War? I saw, I can't remember if it was at the beginning of the Civil War or later part of the Revolutionary War. I can't really remember. Okay, there's only one way to find out, obviously. And that's to look it up. Okay, computer. So, you get to listen to us, folks, we look up something real quick. Not the first time we've done this on this show, no. have, is it? No. Absolutely not the first episode we've looked something up in. Francis got key. Yes, right. National anthem. Oh, he was a lawyer. I just learned that, that he was a lawyer. Okay, so Francis Scott Key was the lyricist. John Stafford Smith was the music. 1814. Yep. Lyrics, 1814. So it was written. Well before the Civil War, but. During the defense of Fort McHenry. War of 1812 would be a. During the, yeah, during the War of 1812. During the Battle of Baltimore. Oh no, after he witnessed the bombardment of Fort McHenry by British ships of the Royal Navy in Baltimore Harbor during the Battle of Baltimore. So after he witnessed that, then he wrote the poem, which was set to the music. And it says music by John Stafford Smith, but it's... um. It's not actually written. He, I mean, he put down the music. John Stafford Smith put down the music on paper, but it's actually an old British drinking song. And I remember that from How Booze Built America. Yep. Another good show, courtesy of the History Channel, I believe. Or the Discovery. Those two work together so much, I get confused over who's got what. I don't know. Mike Rowe. Mike Rowe, yeah. I think it was the History Channel because he does so much with the History Channel. So, there you go. It was originally... Yeah. To, to Anacreon in Heaven was the name of the original song. Okay, so there you go. That cleared that up. Our national anthem was written after the Revolutionary War, but before the Civil War. So, it was 1814, so, yeah. So, the uh, fireworks still did not have color. By no. the time that Francis Scott Key was writing. So when did they get color? That's the question. Well, that's the question that's about to be answered, isn't it? Yes. It was actually another 20 years later. Yeah. The color was added by pyrotechnicians in Italy. They added chlorinated powder and metallic salts. Strontium makes red. Yeah. Barium makes green, copper makes blue, and sodium makes yellow. And I don't know, I, I, I don't know about you, but I was surprised when I learned that copper makes blue. Maybe it's because I don't understand chemistry as well as you do. I'm a little surprised because when I was, when I see copper, I always associate it with green. But I can see it making a bluish flame. Well, to me, copper, when it's polished, it has sort of a reddish sheen. Yeah, but when it corrodes, it turns green. Yeah, when it corrodes, it turns green. So I figured it would make the green not blue, but nope, there it is. It makes a blue flame. <clears throat> Sodium doesn't surprise me at all. No. Yeah. And, of course... I believe 
additive color is what happens here? Because it's not subtractive color, is it? I think you get you mix them to make, I, and that's additive color theory. I think so to make some more unusual colors. The purple, the green, and the orange. Yeah. Which all looks cool, but then you have the gold, and I'm not sure exactly what element gets added in to make the gold fireworks. There are, I knew a person who used to work for the FBI, and he told me there are various other elements can be added to create almost every color of the rainbow, but some of them are very classified because they are dangerous. Now, of course, there's a company here in the U.S. that will make all sorts of fireworks, and they will make custom fireworks. They will even put your ashes into a firework for you so that when you die, you can really go out with a bang. Yeah. And I think that's interesting. And I do want to say my contact, who I met a long time ago, that I had those dealings with the FBI, I have long time ago lost contact with him, so don't ask me any questions to ask them, because I lost c contact with them due to a party on the ways between me and their child who I was friends with. And honestly, I did not even know that you could actually put your cremains into a firework. Yeah. Until I saw an episode of Only in America with Larry the Cable Guy, and he went to that fireworks company. Yeah. And it's like the only, I think it's the only fireworks company here in the U.S. And... It's not the only one, it's just... It's the, the biggest. It's the biggest. And, and they make a lot of fireworks every year, so... I don't know. I just know that it sounds kind of weird. I'm not sure how comfortable I would feel causing my loved one's remains to explode everywhere. And I also wonder, okay, so the human body is mostly carbon, right? Mm -hmm. we, we are carbon-based beings. Yeah. If your cremains are mixed in with the gunpowder, what color does it make? It depends on what element they mix with you. Okay, so carbon doesn't have an effect? Not really. Okay, because I was wondering, because I know... Oh, well, that's that would make sense, wouldn't it? Because when you take carbon and harden it into a crystalline structure, you get a diamond, which is clear if it's pure carbon. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that makes... Never mind. See, I, I'm telling you guys, this is why we're doing history. Well, another form of carbon is also charcoal. Yes. Graphite. Uh-huh. Both of which burn relatively clear. Just put off smoke. So, there you have it. And this is why we do history and not chemistry, people. Yeah. I flunked chemistry. This is not unschooled chemistry. This is unschooled history for a reason. Not unschooled math, not unschooled chemistry. I mean, I could reasonably do unschooled literature because... <laughs> But, no, unschooled history for a reason. Yeah. That's the passion. That's what we have the most knowledge about. With our not with our knowledge, though, we could also do unschooled religion. But the amount of hate mail we'd get from people, whoo, we wouldn't have time to read it all. Yeah, so, unschooled history it is. And let's face it, it's a very, very fun topic. Yeah. So. And now you know where the colors come from in your fireworks. From various elements being added to the gunpowder. And you can thank the Italians for it. So thank you, Italian pyrotechnicians of the 1830s. <laughs> so you have the M80s that are illegal now and the cherry bombs that are illegal. Although... You go to a fireworks stand, you will see M80s and cherry bombs being sold. Those are not the ones called M80s and cherry bombs by the government. Or if they are, be careful because those are considered illegal by the government. Well, actually, no. Depending on which one you're talking about. If you're talking about the cherry bombs, it depends on your um, locality. The M80s, be very careful. Actually, what you're seeing, honey, I'm going to correct you. 
sweetheart. Okay. Actually, what you're seeing is a modified version of them because they, if you reduce it to 5% or less of the original, which means reducing it to 50 milligrams of powder or less, then it's legal. It's a rebranding. So it's a rebranding and... In fact, one of the ones in this chart, I can't remember which one, is actually from the 90s, from 1995. But the M80, there's one on there that was called an M80 a long time ago that's now properly classified as an M1000. Honey, I haven't got that on here. I know, but it, it was equal to a quarter stick of dynamite. Didn't your dad used to... My dad and my grandpa both talked about those. You don't mm, mm, beware of those things. They will actually kill you if if you're not careful with them. And honestly, I don't think I'd want to play with them. <laughs> so, yes, definitely make sure that what you're doing is legal. Here at Unschooled History, we can not tell you or advise you as to what is legal or not legal in your jurisdiction because that varies from city to city, county to county, state to state, country to country. We cannot tell you what is legal or not in your jurisdiction. If you want to know what is legal in your jurisdiction as far as fireworks goes, talk to your local law enforcement agency, local sheriff's department, local cops, just talk to somebody local in law enforcement. They will be able to tell you what's legal and what's not if you are unsure. In the area that we live in, it's... Well, we're in an unincorporated part of the county. Yeah. And an area, a distance as little as 100 yards can make a world of difference. If you're in a little town near us, fireworks are illegal within the state limits. You are 100 yards into the unincorporated area of the county, they're perfectly legal. And we happen to be just across the street, just across the highway from it being illegal. Mm -hmm. But where we live, they are 100% legal all year round. And it is mid June. Or no, it is the end of June now. Yes. It is the end of June that we, are re that we have recorded this. And we've been hearing fireworks going off since, what, mid-May? About, yeah. Yeah, so about six weeks now we've been dealing with the fireworks. So, At first yeah. it was just sporadic. Now it's become more common. And, of course, in our area we can't tell if it's... It's a popular game. Was that a firework or was that a gunshot? Mm -hmm. Because out in the boonies... And they're not people shooting at each other, no gun violence like that. These are people just shooting guns in the air. Or to celebrate. We live in Redneck Central, y'all. I'm not going to lie. Y'all, fireworks have become so popular over the years for so many things. They're at sporting events, like the Olympics. I mean... Some of the best fireworks I've seen internationally have been on TV for the opening ceremonies of the Olympic Games. London was definitely awesome. Mm -hmm. Very much. I would admit that the Beijing fireworks were super awesome, but they cheated. They used lasers and screens to enhance the fireworks and make them look better than they really were, which really pissed off the company that made the fireworks. I see nothing wrong with doing that. If you let people know it's going to be an enhanced show, they're going to be using multiple platforms. But they lied. Yeah. Like China does a lot. They lied. They tried to say that was just pure fireworks, and no, it was not. Okay, so Disney World, Disneyland, they have a lot of fireworks. They have great fireworks shows. Yes, especially, um, I'm especially fond of the ones at their Epcot Center that they have in the um, 
I would say it's called the Lagoon. They're a big center lake in the middle of Epcot Center. I think. Is was, that the one with the planet? Yes. Yeah, that one's their oldest show. It's been going on since uh, the 90s, I believe. They do have some a laser light show there periodically. And I don't mind it to be incorporated together because they do a very good job. It is really cool looking. Um, China, of course, celebrates the Lunar New Year. Yes. I believe Japan does as well. Yes, and so does most of your... Um, Asian countries. They celebrate the Lunar New Year with fireworks. In the UK, they celebrate Guy Fawkes Day with fireworks every November 5th. Uh, France celebrates Bastille Day with fireworks. Or at least they used to. I think they still do. But with the uh, recent health, the pandemic in the world, I don't know if they celebrate it this year. Most countries celebrate New Year's Eve with fireworks. I know... In Sydney, Australia, they put out an awesome display. Yes. They really do. And, of course, here in the U.S., they're most popular for Independence Day. And, like I said, we're in Redneck Central. In our little area, they are legal all year round. And I, I want to just talk about this. Okay, the top left is... New Year's Eve in London. That's the London Eye. Uh, top right, that is Guy Fox. That is an effigy of Guy Fox with the fireworks. The center one is New is Independence Day in New York City. Bottom left, that's Disney. That should be obvious. Bottom right, that is the Olympics in Sid that were in Sydney. So that was the Sydney Olympics. Mm -hmm. And it, they all just look really, really cool. I love them. I do want to say that uh, almost anywhere fireworks are done in a grand scale, they are really done to good effect. And they're done beautifully. They're often done to music so or that, to some other, something else that's been highly coordinated. And choreographed. But um, And they're done by professionals and most often... Today, they are computerized. And though it doesn't go to the fireworks that you're seeing here, sometimes I think the most beautiful firework, though, is seeing a little kid with their parents, though, setting off the firework known as the snakes or bottle rockets with parent supervision or just simply sparklers or the snap pops. Oh, sparklers were my, were my jam when I was a kid. Always under parental supervision. But the, the light in the child's eye when they do that. Okay, let me tell you all a story. Back when I was a little kid, we always set off the smaller fireworks on my grandparents' porch. And that, that was our deal. The snakes, the poppers, we, we did that on my grandparents' porch. And there was one that my grandmother loves to this day. I think it's called a chrysanthemum. The flower pot. The flower pot. It spins around on the seat, on the ground. And every year, without fail, the stupid thing would chase my mother. Every single year, without fail. And I think that may be part of what always tickles my grandma. Because, <laughs> let's face it, seeing my mother's bad luck with... The, the flower pot is funny because it keeps chasing her. And so, but I do have a lot of really fun memories. Oh, and the parachutes. The parachutes are yeah. fun. And definitely, definitely in the comments, tell us what your favorite fireworks are. Talk to us about your favorite fireworks and memories. Because I want to, we, we want to know. And if you don't know the name of the firework... Give a rough description of it. We don't care. We we just want to know your thoughts because we love y'all. Y'all are awesome. That's all there is to it. You're our community. So, yeah, definitely tell us. Give us some cool fireworks memories. And <laughs> on the Facebook page, and on the Facebook page, feel free to drop some of your favorite pictures that you may have taken with your cell phone 
or a good camera or whatever of fireworks because we want to see those too. Those would be awesome. Definitely would be awesome. Like I just said, we love you, our fans, here at Unschooled History. You are, y'all are the reason we do what we do. And that's why we're going to make the following requests of you. Okay, first, please, please, if you intend to set off fireworks, we ask that you take basic safety precautions. Keep water around just in case, because even little sparklers can hurt you in an accident. You I've never stepped on one before. They hurt. Oh, they hurt. You never know when a little spark is going to hit something dry and set off a fire. That would be bad, and we do not want that happening to anybody. Make sure you dispose of used fireworks appropriately. Make sure that you wet them down when you do. Eye and ear protection should be used if you're the one setting them off, mm -hmm. especially if you're setting off the really big ones. Don't be stupid like us and put the bottle rocket in an actual glass bottle and light the fuse and then aim it away from you. Or if you do, at least make sure that you're not aiming it at anybody else or at a building, please. Or an area with a lot of dry leaves. Or animals. Or vehicles. You we're, know what? Just don't we're, aim we're, it anywhere but straight up. We learned to have our lessons the hard way. Cause, we have. Yeah. And if we haven't learned it the hard way, we've learned it from watching the news reports and reading in the newspapers about what happened when a stray bottle rocket got lodged onto a roof or when somebody was stupid with a cherry bomb or another firecracker and held it in their hands too long. I mean... There are some that you're tempted to just hold and light and then throw, but if you don't throw it soon enough, you're going to get hurt. There's a TV show. I believe it's called Right Now or Right This Minute. It's on late at night here where we live, and they show vi viral videos. If you're affiliated with this show, no, I love your show. But they've shown lots of videos that people have taken – of their fireworks getting, causing buildings to go up, uh, catching other fireworks on fire, doing all sorts of things that do, people do around the 4th of July. And for crying yes. out loud, don't drink and set off fireworks. Yes, these are very funny videos, unless you're actually involved with the incident. The law in the U.S., at least, is that fuses have to burn for at least three seconds and no more than nine Please take advantage of the fuse burning time to get a safe distance away once you've lit the fuse. We don't want to hear about any of y'all getting hurt. We don't want to hear about any of y'all being homeless because of a fire, because you're because of fireworks. We we don't want to hear anything bad. We want to hear good stuff from y'all. Oh, we do. Please, for heaven's sakes, stuff the fireworks with full being fully dressed. <laughs> um. Yes. Sparkle, sparkle burns and other burns on the torso. Um, stepping on a hot sparkler on, with bare feet. Uh, any of those, those can hurt, those hurt bad. And if you got, if it's done by a little one, if it hurts you, picture how much is go, worse is going to hurt somebody small. And further on the, do it, please be dressed while setting off fireworks. Guys, for crying out loud, protect your bits and pieces. I I read a story several years ago in the news about somebody who had actually... Well, let's just say he wasn't going to be producing any more children. Yeah, dropping like a firework in your lap <coughs> is no laughing matter because when it goes off... Uh, you're not going to be anymore. Yeah. Second, please be aware of the needs of your neighbors. We love fireworks. Our neighbors love fireworks, as evidenced by the number that we hear going off 
Um, Which you're actually lucky tonight. They haven't gone off tonight, so I think they're taking the day off because it's Monday. But very often vets can have PTSD from being in battle, and fireworks can set that off. So it's nice to be sensitive about things like that. Yes. Fireworks can scare animals, and a frightened dog or cat can end up getting out of the yard and running off from fear. There's a reason that we always keep our animals in the house when we are setting up fireworks. And quite honestly, in where we live now, we're so surrounded by woods. We go to Mike's parents' house if we want to set up fireworks because they have a much more open area. Yeah. I've just or to my parents. <laughs> we also have a neighbor who is, who is a Vietnam vet. We are very fortunate he doesn't have the severe PTSD for the fireworks. I'm pretty sure he's one of the ones setting off some of the biggest fireworks around here, to be honest. He's been open that he does have some PTSD, but the fireworks haven't been setting him off, thankfully. I think it helps him when he's the one in control. Yeah. But that's not so with all, all vets. So, be sensitive. And, of course, they're noisy. Be nice and try not to be setting them off too late in the evening because, yes, some people do need to be up early for work the next day. And third, if you're on public land to set them off, please make sure that you have a permit if you need one. Again, local laws will vary. Make sure that you clean up your fireworks and dispose of them properly. Nobody wants to see wild flora and fauna ruined because some jerk decided to leave a bunch of litter, especially something this dangerous. We don't want to see our grasslands or our forests go up in flames because somebody was careless with fireworks or a campfire or whatever. Which leads me to a story in which... We got very, very, very lucky. This was long before I met Michael. I was in high school with a group of friends, and we were at a location that was a national park, and I am not disclosing names. I am not disclosing actual locations. I am not disclosing anything that can be used to identify any of the guilty. I was not aware that this particular thing was going to happen. Uh, Once I became aware that it was going to happen, I darted for the parking lot because I didn't want anything to do with it. Um, Person A, who shall remain nameless, um, decided to pour gasoline onto the bonfire. And the fire ran up the stream of gasoline and into the can. And he had to... Um, tossed the can out into the field, and we are so lucky the field didn't catch fire. And then person B realized, oh, hey, I've got a ton of fireworks. I have a ton of bottle rockets in my vehicle. So person A and person B got together and decided, oh, this is a great idea. Let's toss them into the bonfire randomly. Oh, boy. There's a reason I am not giving identifying information. One, I don't want anybody getting in trouble for something we did more than 20 years ago when we were very young and very stupid. Two, I don't... I don't want to encourage it. Three, I don't want anybody getting mad at me for... Revealing what they did when they were young and stupid. But, and I'm, I although I'm pretty sure. Oh, there was no forest fire, so I'm pretty sure as you're out, lose the statute of limitations. Right? Yeah, there was no forest fire. Nobody actually got hurt, thank goodness. But y'all, that was stupid. 
don't do it at home. Don't do it yourselves. Don't do it. It was stupid when my little group did it. It was very stupid and very dangerous. Please, 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 y'all, please be careful with fireworks. We love you. And as always, if you haven't yet, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Make sure you like our Facebook page. And of course, if you have anything you want to say or anything you want to know more about, make sure you drop it in the comments or on our Facebook page. And be before you go, if you want to know the story behind the picture on the this slide or this particular section, this is the St. Louis Arch and the um, old courthouse. Old courthouse. We want to include this because this is local to us. It's not in our exact neighborhood, but it's close to us. And we we thought it was important because they have a thing called Fair St. Louis, which they show up fireworks every year, except for this year because of COVID. Well, yeah. Not and, to mention the rioting. Yeah, which we think is very beautiful. And people used to come together for this. Now, if you will go back and look at pictures of this, you look up Fair St. Louis after the 80s. You'll go back before the 80s. You'd be looking up a topic called the VP Fair. But I do not recommend doing that because that was not that was not a kind event. The fireworks were great and it drew family together for the fireworks. But the event itself was based on a... It was a, joined together the 4th of July in a province that was based on... Well, I have to say it basically. Racial hatred. Racism. The VP was a racial thing. And the 4th of July was meant to be purity. And because the affairs, the two events coincided in time, they tried to make one big event out of it. And that fell apart when it was made clear to the city officials what was going on. And then it became the Fair St. Louis. And the VP or Veiled Prophet was, um, should we say, given the heave-ho? Yeah. Thank God. Because yeah. here at Unschooled History, we do not stand for racism at all. No, but if you want to see any examples of the fireworks in the 70s and before period of that time, that's what you have to look up. But 80s and after, it's Fair St. Louis, and it's a pure, wholesome family event, and it's just a lot of fun. It really is. That's what it is. It's a lot of fun. So definitely try and have a fun and safe 4th of July weekend if you're here in the U.S., Anywhere else, if you, if y'all are going to be shooting off fireworks at any time of year, please be safe, but definitely have fun. And again, if you have a request for anything, drop it in the comments or drop it on our Facebook page. We love fan re requests, and in fact, next week's episode is coming from a fan request. And as always, thanks for watching.